head and out a moment of prayer. Our gracious uh, Heavenly Father, we are indeed uh, happy tonight for the privilege of coming here to New York to minister to thy people in thy name. We're so happy to meet them, knowing that there is a great tomorrow where we will meet or we'll never have a prayer for the sick, for the sick will be well forever. There will be no more long nights of prayer for the lost because they'll all be saved then. And we're looking for that day when Jesus shall appear, seeing the hours drawing close and signs and wonders pointing to that time. It makes us stop just a moment, Lord, to think about ourselves. Now we're asking that question out. Search me and try me, Lord. And if there be any evil in us, take it out, Father. We, we want to serve you with a pure heart, clean hands. For we know not what hour you may call us and summon us on high. We'll come to meet you. And if there be some in here tonight, Lord, who doesn't know you as their Savior, the pardoning of their sins, neither have they been born of the Spirit of God, may this be the night that they will make that decision and God fill them with his goodness. Heal every sick person, Father, in here, all the afflicted. May there not be a feeble person in the building when the service is over. They are not a sinner. May we see this happen to the honor and glory of God. We ask it in the name of his beloved child, Jesus Christ. Amen. Be seated. It's a grand privilege again to be here tonight to minister again in the name of our lovely Savior, and who is the all-sufficient one. As we were speaking last night on the angel of the Lord at the sign at Sodom, that when this angel was stayed behind to talk to, to Abraham, uh, this man, which was uh, an angel, but it was God in a human form, because Abraham called him a Lord. Any Bible reader knows a capital L-O-R-D Come from in the beginning, God created heaven and earth, which means Elohim, means the all-sufficient one, the almighty one. And God made himself known there to Abraham in a form of a man, uh, just a dusty traveler. He seemed to be, he never said where he come from, but notice when he would speak to Abraham, he said, I will do this. I promised you this, see? And called him by his, his father name, Abraham, which had just been changed from Abram a few days before. But now he's Abraham and called from Sarah to Sarah, a princess. And then God disappeared before Abraham and went down into Sodom. And that was their closing sign. Uh, fire fell from heaven and destroyed all of Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around about showing in a figure what the Gentile world will do. It'll be destroyed. It'll be destroyed by fire. God promised that, that he would no more destroy the world by water, by giving us a sign. God never does nothing without a sign. And he give us a rainbow, a sign as a covenant. He would never destroy the world no more with water. And now, but this time, it's fire. And as Jesus referred to the times, he said, as it was in the days of Noah, when the ark was being prepared, wherein only eight souls were saved by water, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Look at the minority there. As it was, wherein eight souls were saved by water. And he went ahead and gave the morals of that day, eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. And if I was reading that some time ago and was uh, commenting on it, preaching on it. And then I thought Jesus read the same uh, Genesis that I read and you read. So I went back in Genesis 6 to find out what they did in that day. And we find out that the sons of God taken unto them daughters of man. I looked at the translation on there and said, taken unto them women, not daughters. That was just like a Reno, Nevada, this marriage divorce like Hollywood and so forth. And then it said, these were man renowned of old. 
And then he's seen the Life magazine where this great scandal come up in England of those renowned men and those uh, prostitutes and things and how that our governors and oh my, what a conglomeration we're in. Just exactly the picture Jesus said would take place. <laughs> Eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage and knew it not until the day that Noah entered into the ark and then the door was closed. There was no more chance. That was his last sermon. The last sermon that's been preached in any great ministry has been to the impossible to be saved. Noah, his last message was to the impossible to be saved. See, he went in and the door closed behind him. And he's in there seven days before it started raining. See, his message first was preaching, building the ark, and then closed up seven days. And the people said, that old fanatic. He was just in there. He closed the door himself. But God closed it. Amen. Same thing was in Sodom. Look at our Lord Jesus. When he came on earth, he was a young prophet of Galilee. He went into the synagogues. Everyone loved him. He healed the sick. That was his first part of his ministry, the first stage. The second stage was prophecy, where he began to rebuke the Pharisees and Sadducees of his days, tell them what they were and how they were blind and couldn't see it and who he was and so forth and, on, and what was going to happen to him. On this, he was condemned. And on these bases, he was crucified. But they could not stop the message. You can stop the messenger, but not the message. And the Bible said that he ascended into hell and preached to the souls that were in prison that were sometimes disobedient. And there his last message was to the doomed be awful to think now that some of these days that people be going on preaching just like they did in the days of Noah. They'll be going on just the same, but to a doomed world. It's already, the doors is closed. We don't know what time that might happen. So if you're not a Christian tonight, think of it real hard. Give it a serious thought. Now there's only one thing that we know to do is to follow the instructions that our Lord left us. Preach the gospel to every creature. He knows who is saved and who is not. We do not that. We just cast the net into the sea, bring forth of all kinds. But God knows who is saved and who is not. And no man can come to him except the Father has drawn him. And all the Father has given him will come. We know that. See? So we can't say this one is a Christian, that one isn't. Because he said the kingdom of heaven is likened to a man that took a net and went to the sea and cast it in. When he had taken the net in, he had all kinds of things in there. There would be water spiders, bugs, snakes, and fish, and scavenger fish, and good fish. And, but you see, the, the water bugs and things finally crawled back into the water again. But the good fish was kept for the master. Now, we don't know which is. We just cast the net. But you remember, that water bug was a water bug when the net went over him. The influence of the meeting was what caught him. The snake was still a snake. The gospel net just pulled him in. And the scavenger fish was a scavenger fish. The turtle was a turtle. The crawfish was a crawfish. See? But the real fish was a fish to begin with. So he knows which is because he has her names on his book. It's put there when the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. We're here to try to do our part. Our brother Vic has been over on the corner casting a net for many years. Other ministers has been on other corners casting a net. I come to weave my net with you, brethren, so we can just make a great big cast and just keep pulling like fishermen on the corners of the lake. One of these days, the last fish will be taken from the lake. Fishing will be over then. Let us seek out God with all of our hearts, pray and be sincere as we see this hour approaching. Now, tonight we're going to pray for the sick. We give it out. I believe, Billy, I didn't get to talk. Did you give out prayer cards? And speak? Yeah, well, go. Fine. That's good. All right. We, last night, we were going to build up for tonight for a prayer service. And then I thought maybe it'd take a night or two just for the preaching. And we'll see how many hasn't received the Holy Ghost. And so that's the main thing. If, you, um, if, you get, if you're healed, God will heal you. Sure, he already has done it. You just have to believe it. But if you're, you will get sick again if you live long enough, perhaps. But when you're saved, that's different. See that? And uh, now we're going to say this one thing because there's sometimes strangers come in, maybe in the meeting, maybe never seen a healing service. And many times they try to attack that 
a word unto you, a divine healer. Well, there's no, there's only one divine healer. That's God. And frankly, there's only one healer. That's God. Now, doctors don't claim to be healers. They're not healers. They don't claim to be. What if I went out and broke my arm? I hear him went in and say, Doctor, heal my arm right quick. I, I've got to finish my work. You'd say you need mental healing. Well, that's got to be true. See? Now, the doctor can set my arm, but God does the healing. If I cut my hand, I say, Doctor, I cut my hand. Heal it right quick for me. But you can't do that. The only thing he can do is wash it out. If it's widened up, he can sew it. But God has to heal. See? Nature has to develop cells, life. Life has to put that together. The body has to produce calcium and so forth. And has life itself, calcium won't heal. It's life. See, there's no medicine that heals. Medicine only keeps clean while God heals. See, there's no medicine heals. If I should cut my hand and fall down dead here, see, if you'd take me to the doctor and, um, and say, would you heal this man? He'd say, well, he's dead. All right, then he'd say, let's sew it up and you've got some medicine to heal that hand, haven't you? No, we haven't. See, if they'd sew me up and you give me an embalming fluid that'd make me look natural for a hundred years and give me a shot of penicillin every day and put all the salve on that place, it certainly would not heal. Why? Because that life has gone out of it. Well, then which is the healer, medicine or life? Now, you tell me what life is and I'll tell you who God is. God is life. See, you are... We said last night we have so much of the mechanics, not the dynamics. Now, my body is the mechanics, but my body will not operate without the dynamics, the spirit. See? And the spirit operates my body, brings it in control, like an a automobile with no gasoline in it, with no firing power. See? No matter how fine the dynamics, I mean, the mechanics is fixed up, the cylinders the, and the... the Points and plugs and whatever work. It's got to have the current also. We've got to take those together. That's the way God is. It's got to get a believer with God to make the contact. Then something's going to happen. So divine healing is just like salvation. No man that preaches the gospel of salvation for your soul would want to be called a divine savior. But he would be just as much a divine savior as any man would be preaching divine healing would be a divine healer. Because the man cannot say that he could save a person because Jesus has already did that. See? All right. But by his preaching, he points them to Christ, who is the Savior. Divine healing only points them to the finished work of Calvary. For he was wounded for our transgressions with his stripes we were healed. See, divine healing is not something that some man's got that he can place upon you. It's what your faith is in a finished work. If Jesus stood here tonight with this suit on that he gave me, uh, he cannot heal you. He would just, he, he could, might, you might know it, it was Jesus, but he cannot heal you because he's already done it. See, you'd have to believe it. And he would say, my child, you know not that I, by my stripes you were healed. See, he's already done it. It's already a finished work. It's a past tense. We just believe it now. And to me, the word would be sufficient. If you told somebody something, they didn't want to believe it, well, that would... That would settle it. Let go ahead and not believe it. But that's not God. See? It's just like a little song I used to hear a minister and his wife saying, Not as mortals forgive one another, Jesus forgives and forgets. And we can't forget it. See? But he can. He's God. He can forget it. It never was. Put it in a sea of forgetfulness and not even remember it. He's God. He can take it from his complete memory. But we can't do that. He can. Now, when you believe him, that he has did this for you. He healed you when he, when he was wounded for your transgressions. And with his stripes, you were healed. Past tense. Now, the only thing you have to do is to believe it. Now, the Word teaches it. No one can say the Word doesn't teach it. And it does teach it. Now, and we see so much evidence of people being healed everywhere. But there's divine healing. Now, if it would be you or I, if we said our Word... And sovereign like God, well, people didn't want to believe it. They wouldn't have to. After all, it's sin sick. But not God. He also set in the church apostles, prophets, teachers, pastors, and evangelists. See? All that for the perfecting of the body. And in this body, every local body, he gave nine spiritual gifts. And those gifts are 
or different kinds of wisdom, knowledge, uh, speaking in tongues, gifts of healing, interpretation of tongues, and so forth, nine spiritual gifts, all to show his love towards the church. See? And he wants you to stay in order. The great Holy Spirit himself being the tutor of the church. It's too bad we took a bishop instead of the Holy Spirit to be our tutor. See? But we, where the Holy Spirit is a tutor that God gave to the church to raise the church, to bring it up in the admonition of God. So the Holy Spirit freely sets these gifts in the church and they perfectly operate if you just won't get excited and try to just take what you think yourself. Yeah. That's where people make mistakes. I find that among the people that somebody gets all influenced and kind of uh, hipped up a little by the Holy Spirit which is wonderful, stimulated. But there, someone will come to you and say, D does the Lord say so and so? See, you, you don't have to give them an answer. Don't you say it unless God says it. Then you've got, thus saith the Lord. Then nothing can keep it from happening. It's just got to happen. I take anybody to the charge tonight. You never heard the Holy Spirit speak in the meetings of thus saith the Lord, but what had happened exactly that way. Uh, the millions of cases. It absolutely has to be right. If the Holy Spirit would come tonight and say to me by vision, I want you to go to the presidential graveyard tomorrow. I'm going to bring up George Washington. I'd invite the world to come see it done. It could have to happen. For the Holy Ghost said so. That makes it the truth. But until he says that, you just wait. <laughs> see, you know you're saved and you know you're filled with his goodness. You know how if he's in you, he'll act his life out in you. So just be satisfied. If he wants to use you, he'll sure do it. See, he knows where you're at. And I think in doing that with love and fellowship with one another, we forget all these conglomerations and denominations and barriers and the great army of God goes marching on towards the victory. I'm going to read a little portion of scripture tonight, and many of you might want to read along with me if you wish to, why you certainly can. And now we want to turn to the book of St. Matthew, the twelfth chapter, if you'd like to read with me as I read. In the 38th verse of St. Matthew's, the 12th uh, chapter. And I want to announce now what I, the subject I want to speak on is the sign of this time. This is a little familiar text. And I just speak this because I've been praying and I, I don't like to get off on hard preaching and then come back to that line again because anyone knows that the gifts of the Holy Spirit, they work in a certain channel. There are gifts of healing by the same Spirit, gifts of tongues by the same Spirit, just another channel, and you pull yourself from one to the other. So let us read now. There was, then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall be no sign, uh, there shall be no sign be given to it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The man of Nineveh shall rise in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas this year, the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon this year. We find here that our Lord, in the scripture that we have just read, that was right in the trend of what Jews believed. The Jews believed in signs. And they were come to Jesus, these theologians, and was discussing with him that they would like to see a sign from him. Now, you see how blind they were? He had already showed his sign that what he was, that he was a Messiah. We was on that last evening. How many was here last evening? Let's say, that's fine. All right, we was on that last evening and proved to the audience 
that the Messiah sign that he was supposed to show that he was the prophet that Moses was said would raise up. And all who didn't believe this prophet would be cut off from amongst the people. The Lord your God shall raise up a prophet like unto me. And when he'd come and did the sign of the prophet, well, many of them wanted to say that he was a uh, uh, Beelzebub, uh, uh, some evil spirit. And he told him, said, now this, this uh, will be forgiven you. But when the Holy Ghost has come, and you speak against that, doing the same work, of course, it will never be forgiven you in this world or in the world that is to come. Now, we want to approach these things just not uh, lightly. We must sincerely come to this. And see, Jesus made that statement that when the Holy Spirit come to do the same work that he did, that to speak a word against it, it would never be forgiven in the world or in the world to come. Now, remember, the Holy Spirit was not given until Pentecost. And the Jews had already been witnessed to by the person, Jesus Christ. The Samaritans had been witnessed to by the person of Jesus Christ. So a just God could not condemn a just people. There have got to be an unjust people for God to condemn. Well then, this Holy Spirit must return in the last days upon the church and show those same signs as he did then because God never alters his way. God never does one thing this way and another way does something else a different way. See, his first decision is perfect because he's God. His word cannot be altered. He, he, he didn't learn more in these 6,000 years that we have of human history. He never learned more than he did back there because he's infinite to begin with. See? And he never changes his, 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 his word. He, must, he chose to save man by the shed blood of an innocent one. We tried to educate him. We tried to denominate him. We tried everything in the world, social life, and it's every bit failed and will continue to fail till we come back under the blood. That's the only place of fellowship. God never changes. When God says anything, that must forever remain. If God... If a man come to God and God heal that man on the basis of his faith, he's got to do the next man the same way or he acted wrong when he healed the first man. If he saved the man under the blood and that only and will let somebody get in just under um, education or being uh, some theologian or something without the shed blood applied to him, he acted wrong when he required blood for the first man. See? He must ever remain the same. His purpose has always been the same. His actions has always been the same. God at no time ever dealt with any organization. Amen. Find it in the history. Amen. He always deals with one individual. Amen. Never a group. Amen. One individual. Amen. We find in history that when great man raised up, the Lord sent him on the scene. And when they passed away, they had an organization behind him, and there's never been a time that people ever organized, but that organization died Amen. and never did come back again to spiritual right. realms as it was. Amen. I, just, I just got through about 20 years of Bible history. So there's no place that they ever raised again. God deals for today. What he does tomorrow is up to him. Amen. And he always deals with, a, with an individual. See? Of course, a group of men has too many ideas. Look, even the apostles, after they tried to choose one because of Judas falling, they cast lots in a fellow Matthias. That was the best that they could do with the keys to the kingdom. And there's not a scripture wrote where they did anything. But God chose Saul. A ill-tempered little fella, but he had to throw him on his back one day and and let him look up a while, and he said, I'll show him what great things he has to suffer for him. See? See, the church chose Methodists, but God chose Paul. See? That's the difference. God always does his choosing, his election. God does that by election, by his foreknowledge. Now, we find that God always dealt with the people with signs and wonders. He's promised signs of the last days. God cannot change his policy. He always speaks to the people through his prophets. 
There's been many times all through the ages, but God always had a prophet somewhere that he could speak to. Everyone that the word of the Lord would come to, and that only, see, upon that prophet. See, they'd always go down to find out where this prophet was, a seer. Means, a seer means to either foretell or tell forth. He's a seer that sees things that's going to happen, and he predicts it to the people. And the Bible said, if it doesn't come to pass, then don't you hear him. It has to be every time. God cannot fail. Amen. And if it doesn't come to pass, then he said he wasn't with that person. So upon that, the people knew that the word of the Lord was with this seer, that he had the Old Testament seers. Now the Holy Spirit doesn't change that trend. Amen. Jesus said, when he, the Holy Ghost, has come up on you, he will show you these things I've taught you, I've said to you. And he will show you things that is to come. See, Amen. he never changes his system. Always the same. Therefore, we can have confidence in him. But you see, our human part gets ourselves all wound up in different things. And groups of men get together and votes on this and that. That's what throws us off the line. See, and saying, well, this was for another day. No, he's the same yesterday. Amen. And all the word is inspired. All of it. Now, Jesus came exactly in the sign that was to follow him. As Moses predicted that the Messiah would be an anointed prophet, that the Lord would raise up. And he clearly showed that he was that prophet. And now these Pharisees come to him and said, Master, we'll seek a sign from thee. He said, uh, uh, one place he said, if you would like to read it, in St. Matthew, the 16th chapter and the third verse, one to three, they asked him again for a sign. And he said, you blind Pharisees, hypocrites, you go out and see the sun setting and said, you, uh, you say tomorrow it's going to be clear. If it's red and lowering, you say, it'll be foul weather. Said, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the skies, but the sign of the time you can't discern. Right. They should have known it. Now, now, if this Holy Spirit coming in the last days has to exactly be the life of Christ in the church, see, and the world that laughs at that or says one word against it by the authority of God's word shall be destroyed. Amen. So you see what the world's done. So God to rain down judgment out of heaven is exactly in order right now. Our nation, our cities, our world is right for the judgment. Amen. And I'm sure that it's later than we think. He said he'd have to cut it short for the elected sake, or there'd be no flesh saved. Just think of what day by day, year by year, it gets worse. Look at you, holiness people, Pentecostal people, how corruption has entered in among the churches, fussing, going on. Look at our women. It used to be wrong for them to cut their hair. The Bible says it's wrong. But they do it anyhow. It's, uh, the Bible said for them not to do it. And to wear these clothes that look like man's clothes. The Bible said that's an abomination to God. Amen. Oh, you said that's Methodist. That's Pentecostals. Sure. It's all of them. See? Why is it you like your television programs more than you care about reading the Bible? See? You, you make those people your example instead of God's Word. See? Now... And it's got to be judgment. It's constantly getting worse and worse. Now, Jesus told them that there would be a sign. He spoke of the signs of the last day. And he t last night he told us, As it was in the days of Sodom, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man, that the Spirit of God would be revealed in the last day in human flesh, that would be able to discern the thoughts that's in the mind, the heart. Amen. Now, the Bible says the Word of God does that. Hebrews 4. The Word of God is stronger, more powerful, and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the sun or the mire of the bone, and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Amen. That's the reason Jesus was the Word. In the beginning, St. John 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That's the reason he could look up on them and perceive their thoughts. That's the reason you could tell the woman at the well, see, that you have five husbands. 
That's the reason he could say to, to Philip, uh, when he brought Nathaniel up, he said to Nathaniel, Behold, an Israelite in whom there's no God. He said, When did you know me, Rabbi? He said, Before Philip called you, when you were under the tree, I saw you. A discerner of the thoughts. Oh, so many places in the Scripture identifying himself. That wasn't to the Gentiles. Not one time did he ever identify himself to Gentiles like that. Search the Scriptures. Not one time. That's today. Amen. Amen. The Gentiles had 2,000 years of study and theology to take the people from the Gentiles for his name. But now the time has come that this must be done just before the burning, like it was in Sodom. Here was Jesus with his identified, vindicated sign, a scriptural sign to the people. And yet those Jews say, I would like to see you perform a sign. Have you ever seen people that's unbelievers will say that to you? Uh, if there be a, I know so and so up on the street. If you'll heal them, see, uh, or it's, it's you can see it's Satan. The same thing. You know they said, if thou be the Son of God, come down off the cross. They put a rag around his head and said, this guy says he's a prophet. They hit him on the head with a stick with a rag over his face. Said, now prophesy and tell us who hit you. When they pass the stick one to another, said we'll believe you. But you see, God doesn't clown for nobody. Amen. Jesus said, I only do what the Father shows me. See? And that's right. And that's a true servant of God always is obedient to his master. See? Not to show off or, or say something to elate somebody else, but be honest and true with him and send him. That's the true servant of Christ. Like Eliezer, a representative coming from Abraham. See, to pick up the bride to... to Isaac, the beautiful Rebecca, obedient to model servant, see, is about his master's business alone. What a type of the Holy Spirit today, the same thing. Amen. Picking out a bride, see, in the evening time, when the lights are going out. Amen. Now they wanted to see a sign. Though he'd been identified, thoroughly scriptural signs, yet they didn't want to believe the Bible signs. They wanted him to clown. Don't you see? That's the same kind of a spirit that said, If thou be the Son of God, Command these stones to be turned into bread. If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down off of here, because it's written, and give these angels charge over thee. Lest any time the dash your foot against the stone, they bear thee up. But he wasn't dashing his foot against the stone. See? Certainly. And he said also there, if you notice, when he put this uh, upon the cross and so forth. Now that spirit here is in these Pharisees saying, we would seek a sign. He said, a wicked, adulterous generation will seek after a sign. Notice. And he, God in all ages has had signs for his people. And without doing anything, God sends a sign. Always. He sends a sign first. And he promised he would do the same thing because he cannot change. So when we see the end time appearing and the signs of the end time, even the last sign that was promised before Sodom burned, we've had joy. We've had the... The stars shaking in the heaven. We've had wars and rumors of wars. We've had earthquakes in diverse places and all those things. With the gifts of the Spirit has returned back to the church. We've had all these different manifestations, great healing services and things showing. That's all a sign. But the last sign, just before the Gentiles were burned, was the sign God manifested in human flesh. Right? And Jesus said that'll be at his return. We ought to be careful now and get really right with God. Be sure that you're right. Now, they were to, the Jews was always to rely upon their signs. You know that. Instead of their theology and lectures, they had to lie right upon the sign because the real true believer always believes that God is a God of power. Amen. And where God is, signs has got to happen. You see, it's just like pounding a piece of steel hot on an anvil, you see. Sparks has got to fly. It reflects. And everywhere God is, it also, there are signs and wonders. Jesus said, these signs shall follow them to believe the ministry throughout the world. See, these signs shall follow them. Always signs. God always gives signs like he did in the beginning and gives them to every generation at the end. He did it in Noah's time. Noah was a sign to that generation. That's right. He was a fanatic to the eyes of the world, to the scientists. Why, well, his, his message was nothing like cope with their scientific understanding. He said, water is coming down from the heavens and going to flood the earth. They might be able to shoot the moon or with their radar or whatever it was. 
They said there's no water up there. I can scientifically prove there is no water there. We might have said the scientists. But Noah said, God is able. <laughs> if there's no water there, he's a creator. He can put water there. And he knows how to do it. But he was a sign. He went ahead building an ark and there was no water for it to float in. But he, he built it anyhow. He was a sign to that people. Well, Moses was a sign in Egypt when they seen these great miracles and so forth. Solomon, on down then, we find here that they called Jesus the sign that he was giving them, the true prophetic sign of their scripture. Now, there's a lot of signs that's not scriptural signs. We must have scriptural signs. Amen. It must come thus saith the Lord out of this Bible. Yes. See? Then we know it's right. Of course, there's a lot of things that goes with that. That God can do anything he wishes to. He's God. But I know he keeps his word. So I want to see it from his word. Then I know it's true because it's a word. Now, we find out that in this time, Jesus showing his scriptural sign and Yet they call that scriptural sign because they didn't want to believe that to be a scriptural sign. They had to find an answer to the people, so they said, it's, it's his mind. He's, he's possessed of a devil. And he's called, they call him Beelzebub. And he was rebuking them for that. What will it be when he comes again? Notice, he referred to Jonah as it was in the days of Jonas, meaning Jonah. So shall it be in the son, coming of the Son of Man. Now, many people condemn Jonah. I do not condemn Jonah. You know, they say, well, he's a Jonah. You've heard that expression. But you mustn't do that, uh, Christians. You shouldn't condemn God's servants. Jonah was a prophet. He was not out of the will of the God. He did just exactly. He must do that for a sign. Everything happens not by just happening. It happens for a sign. One time a prophet had to marry a prostitute, had children by her. One laid on his side for 340 days and then turned over on the other side. One stripped his clothes and this everything did for signs. See? And Jonah had to do it for signs. Remember, Abraham had to marry Hagar against his own will when Sarah gave the handmaid. But he refused it. But God appeared to him and said, Listen to Sarah, because the free woman will not be heir with the bondswoman. She had to have the child be cast out. What was it? A sign. All of it is signs. God does things for signs, and Jonah was a sign. Now, if you notice, Jesus refers to it here. A weak, wicked, and an adulterous generation will seek after a sign, and they'll get it. For as the prophet Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so must the Son of Man see, be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. What was Jonah then a sign of? He was a sign of the resurrection. Amen. All right. Now, if there ever was a perverted generation, we're living in it. We know that. Amen. It's perverted mentally, physically, sexually, everything. It's perverted. A wicked generation. Unbelievers. Uh, more than I guess we ever had. They're, they are the... The ecclesiastical type of unbelievers, and that's the hardest to deal with. I'm a missionary. I stood on the fields and seen where they brought the heathen up that didn't even know which is right and left hand. They wouldn't know. Well, he's a, he's comes in in his condition. He never heard of God. Now he wants to see something, and as soon as you can prove to him what's truth, he'll accept it. But the educated heathen, see. That's an awful word to use, but it's the truth. The, the educated heathen, he wants to draw his own opinion about it. See? He knows so much about it. He can't humble himself to just faith to look at God's Word. That's what he, those Pharisees was in that day. They couldn't just look at the Word. There it was, but they wouldn't want to see it. And the pitiful part to know that they were actually blind. God did that for a sign. Now, See, today then, the sign that this wicked generation that we're living in will see will be the sign of the resurrection. Amen. He didn't say it would be one, a wicked and wilderness generation, seek after sign, and they will receive the sign of Jonah, the resurrection. And in this wicked, adulterous, perverted uh, generation that we live in worldwide, don't think you've got them all in New York. You haven't got them. 
They're all over the world. Don't think America is the only one who has them. They're all over the world. Doctrine this generation. See, they are the one to receive the sign of the resurrection. And all these days that when we got Buddha, Sikhs, James, all every kind of religions, thousands of them, farms around the world, every one of them can take you to the grave of their founders. But Christianity has an empty tomb. Yeah. Yeah. Not only that, but you can't tell that people say, He lives in my heart. They'll bring you right back to His Word. You certainly will. They'll bring you right back to His Word. They, you can't produce psychology to, to the heathen. See, because his God lives in his heart, too. I've seen the Mohammeds lay in the street and say, Allah, Allah, until they come so frenzy, till they would take a piece of, a piece of splinter and run it through their, their fingers. Never feel it. I've seen a man at Zurich, Switzerland, take a sword and put it right to his lungs like this and run it right through and had a doctor come to the platform and pour water through one of his sword and run out the other. Pull it out and not even bleed. See? Take a lance and stick it through their chin up through their nose. Now, you better know what you're talking about when you go talk by God to a man like that. You better know. This psychology won't work. He'll let you know that right quick. You've got to know what you're talking about. But remember, the God lives with Elijah on Mount Carmel. He's still God today. Just as he is. Now, I've seen him before. Literally hundreds of thousands of people do it. See, See which doctors by the score standing there and challenge you. Watch the Holy Spirit, what he does. You've read the books and you know and the sign statements of what the God does. He's still God. He's obligated to his word. Now, he's not obligated to your desires. He's obligated to his own word. Okay? Now, we find here these heathens, the way they would do. Now, God in this last days promised that he would show the wicked and adulterous generation the sign of his resurrection. That he is not dead. He's alive. He keeps every word. He lives it right through you a little while, and the world will see me no more, said Jesus. Yet ye shall see me. See? Talking to the believer. For I... I is the personal pronoun. I will be with you, even in you, unto the end of the world, the consummation. And the works, St. John 14, 12, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Same works. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. Now the church has come up to the, the score of the church ages after the first Ephesian church age in the Bible, and if the Lord willing, for I leave here, I want to preach on a little subject called the countdown <laughs> and see how we have come, how we've progressed. Now notice, now on the, uh, the Ephesian church age and those church ages, until it went into the dark age of a thousand years of darkness, and then Luther being the first reformer, he come out with justification. Here come Wesley with sanctification. Here come the Pentecostals with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The church constantly getting into the minority. Greater powers when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of God will rise a standard against him. And now we've left the Pentecostal age. Now we are coming to where like in the pyramid, not pyramid doctrines now, but I mean like as the pyramid, the headstone when it comes to fit, it's got to be honed. There's got to be a ministry in the church, the true church of the living God, to where when the headstone comes, Christ, that the ministry of Christ and Christ will fit right in together perfectly. Then that brings back the redeemed to take the whole house of God to glory. The Methodist, Baptist, and Presbyterian through those great Reformation ages that come out and gave their lives and persecutions and things for the kingdom of God. But that stone is coming. Amen. Yes, sir. It certainly will come. God will send it. It will fit all the building together upon us. Amen. Now, we see these signs as we see the ministry from Christ beginning to narrow up now to the complete ministry of Christ in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Under Luther, it was the same Holy Spirit, justification. Then sanctification under Wesley, the message. Then the baptism of the Holy Spirit, making three uh, three, not three steps of grace, but uh, three stations, I might call it. Notice, like this, when a baby is born, 
there is uh, uh, three things that constitutes its birth. The first thing in normal birth, you had to listen close now. The young children will never catch it, but that's see the first thing in a normal birth is water, then blood, then life. See? Now that's the same thing that constitutes the new birth. Water, blood, spirit. The elements that came from his body is what makes his body. See? He come from his body is the material that takes to, to make his bride because Adam had his bride taken from his body. Christ has his bride taken from the body. And when Christ died, there were three elements that came from his body. Water, blood, spirit. Justification through believing water. Sanctification through the blood. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, this last great step must come into the perfection that the Holy Spirit has to live in that church so perfectly it will make the head and the body unite together. See? See? That's the body. He is the head and the body. Now, we find that he promised in these last days that that would be done. We find it. Now, Jonah, many people I've said about Jonah, they said, well, that fellow was an unbeliever. No, he wasn't. He was supposed to go to Nineveh. That's exactly right. Because it's a great city uh, filled with sin and maybe a half a million people in it. And they was very, very bad. There's a great commercial city. Their occupation chiefly was fishing, I understand. And um, so they were, he was sent down there, but he got on the wrong ship and went to, to Tarshish. Now, many people try to say that he didn't want to do that. I believe it was all planned by God. I was reading a little story. It might bear record to say at this time to kind of justify Jonah to get in what I want to say. Now, Jonah, when he took the wrong ship, the first thing you know, he was going the wrong way, and they got in trouble. The winds began to blow. The, the waves began to roar. And everybody thought the ship was going to sink. So Jonah was fast asleep, and they said, Rise, old sleeper, and call upon your God. And Jonah confessed that he was in the wrong. He said, Now you bind my feet and my hands and throw me overboard. And then the storm will cease. And they did that. God had a great fish prepared. Now, I heard a scientist here not long ago in Louisville, Kentucky, where I used to live at Jeffersonville, just across. They had a whale frame laying on a, on a flat car. And uh, this fellow was uh, lecturing this scientist and telling about how many teeth he had and, oh, I don't know. So then finally he said, you know, the, the Bible story, he said, which is not true. He said, the Bi and that was just too much for me. So I just moved up a little closer. I thought I'm going to see what he's going to say. And he said, the Bible story of, um, of the whale swallowing Jonah. He said, I want you people to look. How could a man get through his throat? when you couldn't even throw a baseball through his throat. So he said, that's wrong. I just couldn't stand and let that infidel say such things as that. I said, I beg your pardon, sir. Did you ever read the Bible? He said, certainly. Well, I said, then you make a statement like that? God never said it was a whale. God said it was a fish. He said, well, that would be a whale. I said, if it let it be a whale, it was a special prepared for God prepared a fish like that. This one is special. He can make one that the whole boxcar can run into. He's God, see? So that is true. We, we don't want to believe that those things, their Bible stories, God prepared this fish for Jonah. He is a special fish. So he, he swallowed Jonah, and now he was down in the belly of the whale, and his hands tied behind him, and his feet tied. Now, you can imagine a, a what condition that man was in. And anyway, the, the whale, or like any other fish, perhaps it prowls through the water till it finds its food, and then it goes down to the bottom of the sea. Now, you feed your little goldfishes and watch him. He gets his little belly full, and he goes down to the bottom of the sea and puts his little swimmers out, and there he rests. See, because he's, he's found his food. Well, when this fish had found uh, the prophet and had swallowed him, well, then he must have went down in, in the bottom of the sea. Now, I don't know that he did, but I'll say he, he, uh, he might have done it. And now, here is this man. Now, we're always, as it's a too bad, but we're always trying to think and show our, Satan showing us our symptoms. Well, you see, you're not any better than you was yesterday. You, uh, you see, you're no better. Don't look at symptoms. 
If anybody could have symptoms, it would have been Jonah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. See? Everywhere he looked was the whale's belly. Yeah. But you know what he said? They're lying vanities. Yeah. He never said, I'm going to look at this. He said, once more will I look to your holy temple. For he knew when Solomon prayed and dedicated that temple, said, if thy people be in trouble anywhere and look to this holy place and pray, then hear from heaven. He had confidence in Solomon's prayer. A man, an earthly man like you and I. He, after a while, even backslid, women brought him away from God. And, but his prayer was heard by God. And he could have faith under them circumstances. And how much more faith are we to have? When we don't have to look to a temple built by a man, but to heaven itself, where the Son of God sits at the right hand of His Majesty, with His own blood, ever living to make intercessions. And as none of us has that kind of symptoms like that, we see people healed in the presence of God all the time. We should never look to symptoms. They're lying vanities. Look to God. That's who made the promise. Now, we find out Whatever taking place, however God got oxygen to the prophet, I don't know. But he, he lived for three days and nights according to the Bible. And I don't know how far Tarshish was and how far it was from Nineveh, how far out in the sea they were. But Jonah stayed alive according to the Scripture for three days and nights. He called himself. That's impossible. How about calling Lazarus after being dead for three? Four days. Amen. And he'll call us someday, though we be dead ten thousand years. He's God. Now we find him now. And here he comes up to Nineveh. The whale's coming right through the water like taxing him. A taxi ride on the bottom of the sea. Coming right up to Nineveh. And it must have been about noon. Well, now those people were fishermen. And they were out pulling in their nets and so forth, their commercial fishermen. And they were heathens. They worshipped idols. And one of their gods, like the Indians used to have here in America, the grizzly bear was a god of Vegas, which he was a god worshipped by heathen Indians before they were brought into Christianity. They had a god, god of power. And... In Nineveh, I'm told that the whale was a sea god because he's a master of the sea. He can swallow up anything. And about noontime, here comes their god up out of the sea, just opens up his mouth, and the prophet walks right out on the bank. No wonder they believe. See? They certainly they believe because the prophet that was given the message come out of their god's mouth. Repent, or this city is going to perish. See? So he wasn't out of the will of the Lord. He was doing just as God makes everything work together for good to them that love God. That's right. And well, called according to his purpose. Jesus referred to him. Then one more before we close the prayer line. He referred to Solomon also. Now when God sends a gift to the earth and the people respect it, it's always a golden age for that people. But when they reject it, it's always chaos for that people. He, he does that. Every age, just look, look when they rejected Jesus and when they rejected the prophets and so forth. What it was. But in Solomon's time, they believed all of them. Solomon had a gift of discernment. God gave it to Solomon. It, and people believed it. All was one accord. They were, they were called the, the millennium almost for the Hebrew race at that time. It was a golden age. Solomon's age, no wars or nothing. He prospered it. They built the temple and all these great things that they'd done through Solomon's age because he was a type son of David, you see, the fleshly son of David. Now, we find that in this time, when they built the temple and everything, everybody respected that gift that God gave them and even made him their king. And the fame went everywhere. I'm telling you, Americans. If we would only respect the gift that God has sent us, the Holy Ghost, we wouldn't have to worry about the Russian astronauts and the atomic bombs and things. Well, that's our, our security is Christ. He is our security. But the trouble of it is He sends us the gifts and we laugh at the scorn, just like they did. That's the reason we are bound for judgment. We have, it has to strike. It's just God's no respect to person. If God would let this world get by, this New York, 
this America, this world, get by with what is done now without bringing judgment up on it. He'd be duty-bound as a just God to raise up Sodom and Gomorrah and apologize for burning them up. For he burnt them up for the very same things that we're doing right now. See? So he promised it would be this way. Now, we found now that in the days of Solomon, could you imagine, everyone speaking of God. Oh, Solomon's great power of discernment. That was a gift that we could discern. And everybody was bragging about it. There was no confusion saying, oh, no, no. All of them believed it. And the fame spread into other nations. And nations become afraid of Israel. But not because they had a better army, but because God was among them. That's what brings fear. God. God was among them. Oh, how it ought to be with us professing a Christian nation. It's too bad that denominations and things has twisted us in such a condition as we're all out of form today. No man knows hardly what to believe. And watch. Then the fame of Solomon went all the way down into Sheba. The queen heard it. She was a heathen. And every only way they had then, they didn't have television and things that we have today or the press. The only way they had to send messages is lift the ear. And every time a caravan would come in, no doubt the little queen would go out and say, Did you pass through Palestine as you came down? Yes. Is that so what they say? Oh, you should see it. Nothing like it. Those people's got a revival up there. You, it's a nationwide affair. Oh, they're having a wonderful revival. And their God has anointed their king. And he's got a gift of discernment. And you've never seen anything like There's nothing can exceed that wisdom. He can tell anything. It's, it's beyond the wisdom of a man. It's the discernment from God. And they all, well, they, her, you know, faith cometh by hearing. Hearing the Word of God. Not hearing it, we're Methodists, Baptists, or Pentecostals, but hearing the Word of God. And faith cometh by hearing. And when the, she would hear, hunger set in. Well, now she decided, after she had heard all this, before she'd say anything about it, that she would go see for herself before she passed her comments. Oh, wouldn't that be nice if we'd all do that? Yeah. Go. No doubt that she got up many scrolls, the Bible, of the prophets, of what they'd prophesied, to see the nature of their God, Jehovah. Now, this little queen had many things to confront her before she went up there. The first thing, being a pagan, she'd have to go to her priest to ask permission because she was a queen and a member of the church. So I can imagine her going up to the priest and saying, Father, can uh, I go up to Israel to uh, attain uh, some wisdom from this great man Solomon who their God has bestowed wisdom upon? I can hear him say, My child, I never would have thought such out of you. Our, our denomination is not cooperating in that revival. But, you know, but how it would be today, I'm making it now from the sublime to the ridiculous, of course, but uh, it would be the same spirit today would say that. See, the same spirit would bring, grant it that way. Then, she, you mustn't do that. You see, because after all, those people are, they're fanatics. They believe in all kinds of signs and things, but... Well, you see, everyone knows that they're a bunch of fanatics, like seas drying up and all these kind of things that they've had. There's none of it true, see? It's just a tale that's been told or a song that's been sung or something, and there's nothing to that. But you know, when real faith strikes into a heart, they begin to hunger. They want to see. There's not a person living but what likes to look past the time, the curtain. Where did I come from? Who am I? And where am I going? Of all the fine books that's been read, the great master's lectures that have been made, there's only one book that reveals who you are, where you come from, and where you're going. That's it. That's it. And it also lets us look past the curtain to see it. Now, when they seen this take place, she heard about this. Then she says, I'm going to go anyhow. So no matter what the bishop says or whatever it was, she's going to go anyhow. Determined because she wants to see something real. Amen. Something. Well, then the priest might have said to her, said, Now, look, daughter, you're a queen. You mustn't associate with such people as that. Regardless, I'm a human being. It's got to die, too. 
Well, now, if there was anything like that going on, he would be right here in our church. Of course, that spirit isn't dead either. See? If that's come through ours, or it isn't right. Well, she might have said, I've been here since I was a little girl dedicated. I've seen all these idols and statues and so forth. And you've talked about them being gods. My grandmother belonged here, my great-grandmother, my great-great-grandmother. And there's not one of them that showed anything, any sign of life. They say that that's life. There ought to be some more people with that kind of an idea like that queen had right here in New York and all over the world. I want to see it myself. And I don't see those idols. I hear you read all kinds of books and prayer books and so forth. But what is it? I never see a move of anything that's alive. It's all dead. Some theology or something. My heart's hungering to see the... Where is there a God? Where is He? Oh, may the world hunger for that. Where is He? If He ever was God, He's got to still be God. If He didn't, He died. He's the same, the Bible said, yesterday, today, and forever. Now, notice, her heart began to hunger. Now, so she had a good idea. She said, I'm going to take quite a bit of money and some frankincense and self mirror. And if that thing is right, I'm going to support it. If it isn't right, I'll leave it alone. She could sure teach Pentecostals. <laughs> support something that calls you a holy roller and everything else, and you still support it. Oh, my. And the gift of wisdom is supposed to be in the church. <laughs> now, notice. That's for the pastors to say. Now, notice. Then she says this, I'll take my gifts with me. And if it isn't the truth, I can bring my gifts back. That's good. Amen. Now, the little lady got ready to go. She'd taken a few eunuchs, all this money in her maids. Now, just think, the distance she had to travel to find out whether this was right or not. See? Measured on your map from Palestine down to Sheba. It's exactly 90 days, three months on the back of a camel. She didn't, she had difficulties. She couldn't come in an air-conditioned Cadillac like we do. But she, she come all the way from the uttermost parts of civilization, the world at that time, to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And people live across the street and won't come to hear something that's greater. Order, Jesus said, she'll rise in the last days and condemn this generation. She had troubles in the way. Remember the sons of Ishmael, them fleet riders out there were robbers in the desert. How easy it would have been for a great band of those Ishmaelites to fall up on that little queen and kill those half a dozen eunuchs and take all that treasury. But there's somehow or another that when a heart goes to hunger after God, troubles don't look like anything. You've got your mind set no matter what anybody calls you. They can call you whatever they want to. They can say whatever they want to. They can try to put every stumbling block in your way. But if you're thirsting for God, you're going to find it somewhere. That's all, dude. Nothing's going to stop you. Husband isn't going to stop you. Wife isn't going to stop you. Church isn't going to stop you. Pastor isn't going to stop you. There's nothing can keep a saint away from his God. No. She never even thought of it. You don't think either what this is going to say and what mother's going to say and dad's going to say or husband's going to say. When you come to find Jesus Christ to be reality and you hear that he is alive, there's nothing going to stop you. When that hunger, that seed that's been predestinated before the foundation of the world, when the light strikes that, it's coming to life that quick. This little woman was that type of seed, yet being an alien, a heathen. Now... I remember she probably had to travel by night. It was so hot on that Sahara Desert. And, and she had traveled by night, maybe reading the scrolls. Now we'll find out what the prophets said here about what God was. A revealer of the secrets of the heart. And if there be one among you, spiritual or prophet, I, the Lord will make myself known to him, speak to him in visions. And if what he says comes to pass, hear him. I'll find out when I get there. That's what that God is. I'll find out. Notice. Now... After a while, she finally arrived at the revival. It was going. It was a revival. 
So she arrived. Now she didn't come just to say, I'll go in and sit down a few minutes, and if I hear him say one word that my creed doesn't agree with, up I go. No, she's going to be at the judgment to judge that time. See? She come to stay until she was thoroughly convinced. Amen. If we could just do that. Just be irreverent and sit still and say, now, this is something that might look like it could be right. I don't know. I'm not going to criticize. I'm just going to sit still and I'm going to watch and then I'm going to compare it with the scripture and see if it's right. You owe that to yourself. Now, she come from the utmost parts of the world. She went out into the, probably the courtyards of the temple and she set up her tents and what more. And maybe, now, I'm going to drama this for the young folks and so forth. Maybe that morning... When the church opened up, the trumpets sound, the priests blow the trumpets, and the music played, and so forth, and all the, the children begin to gather in, and maybe she got her seat way back at the back. Usually that's the way it happens. And she got way back at the back. Well, she watched when Pastor Solomon came out, and he, they introduced him, and he spoke to the people, and read the scriptures, and they prayed. And then the first case come up. Now she'll say, I'll just see how much discernment this is. And when she saw that discernment, I guess the next meeting she moved a few seats forward. <laughs> Maybe she, uh, uh, that, this, uh, please, if it sounds sacrilegious, forgive me. Maybe her prayer card wasn't called just that one meeting. See. She uh, had to wait a little while. I'm trying to get something to the people, you understand. And maybe it, it wasn't that. But however, finally, she watched case after case, and she was convinced. But wait till it happens to her. That's the one she wants. And the Bible said that when she was brought in the presence of Solomon, that there wasn't anything, any question in her mind, but what Solomon made known. Amen. God revealed to her, revealed to Solomon, all the things that she had need of in her life. And when he did this, it happened to her then. And she stood up and she said, All that I have heard was right and more than that. She said, And blessed is the man that set your daily and see that great gift working, that great sign. Blessed are the men who are with you here and see these things daily. She accepted God. She had seen something real. Her heart was put to buzzing. She found something that was genuine, something that wasn't a dead creed, something that wasn't an idol. It was a living God. Now, no wonder Jesus said that the Queen of the South shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the utmost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, a greater than Solomon is here. And even in the days of the Lord Jesus, the Emmanuel, God, made flesh. God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. He was the living word. And in that day, even telling them to criticize his ministry of that type, that he would forgive them, said that when the Holy Spirit came, you've got 2,000 years more education to the Bible than they had there. 2,000 more years that the Holy Spirit has been moving on the earth. Now, if she condemns that generation, what will she do with this generation? A greater than Solomon is here. The little lady saw something real. I've told this little thing before, but I believe it bears telling right now before I call the prayer line. I like to hunt. Uh, I, just a uh, second nature to me. I, I love it. My conversion never took that from me because I like to get into the wilderness. I used to hunt up north here and um, used to hunt here in the Adirondack years ago. And uh, I'd get out there and get on top of the mountains watching the sun rise and set and cry and stay out there for weeks and hear God speaking through nature. That's where he, uh, my first Bible was nature, to see how a little seed could fall on the ground and freeze that deep. A seed burst open, the pup run out, and every sign is gone that you can see, but next spring it lives again. See? God made a way for it. If he made a way for the seed to live again, I said, there's some way for me to live again. That's right. So... 
That was my first Bible. I used to hunt with a little Yankee up here that was a fine hunter, but he was very cruel and hard. And he was a he was a good man, I guess. He was a nice fellow to hunt with, and you never had to bother about hunting him up. He knew where he was at, and we hunted. But he was so really cruel in his heart. And I said to him many times, I said, "Why are you so cruel?" In the the fellow not making fun of him or anything, but he had kind of a, eyes looked like a lizard, and he and he would look at me and say, "Oh, go on, preacher, get next to yourself, Billy. You never make a hunter and a preacher too." He said, "You know, you're too chicken-hearted." And um, he used to kill fawns just to make me feel bad. Uh, the little fellers, I hate to kill. Them. So he said, uh, "It's all right. If the law says kill a fawn, that's all right. But just not kill him for fun." Abraham killed a calf, and God eat it. And that's right. See? So it isn't the size of the animal, but nothing but just to kill it to be mean, that's murder to me. I think that little fellow should live. Do you have need of it? Well, if the law says you can take it, well, all right. You know, I was seven years a conservation officer. So then there was a... That's why I served the Baptist church. So then when this fellow, he was so cruel about it. One year I went up there, and he had made him a, a little whistle. Now, I'm not throwing that to the Baptist people, see. No. See, I didn't mean that that way. I was... I wasn't out on the field. Uh, I wanted to work. I've always worked till just when I had to go in this um, uh, evangelistic work. Uh, and yet, I've never took an offering in my life. See? That's right. See? But I, I never asked a person for a penny. Uh, I want my life to come down to time where I have to say something pretty soon, like Samuel stood. He said, Have I ever told you anything in the name of the Lord but what come to pass? Have I ever took money from you your living? <laughs> That's right. They said, no, you haven't. But they wanted their king anyhow. So, so that's probably the way it'll turn out. So it's usually that. But this fellow, uh, I liked him. And one fall I went up there and he'd and been a little whistle and he could go just like the little pawn, that's a little baby deer, a crying for its mama. So uh, I, he said, hey, I want to show you something, Billy. And he had this little whistle and he blow. I said, you wouldn't do that. And he said, oh, there you are. You'll never get over it, will you? And I said, no, sir, not to be like that. So we, we went hunting, and it was late in the season. I had to come up, and you all hunters in here know them little white-tailed deer. They're Houdini is no escape artist at all for them. So that when they get scared. And so uh, they've been shot at, and there's a little strip of snow on the ground, a little, what we call a little skiff down the south, about four or five inches, good enough to track. And we went about a half a day, and I thought that we carried a, a little a thermos bottle full of hot chocolate, which is gives you energy in a sandwich. And we usually sit down when we go up the top of the mountains and he cut down over one range and I'd go down the other, coming back and getting camped sometime that night. So I thought it's about 11 o'clock or something and I thought he would just sit down on a little snow bank there, a little place opening about twice the size of this room. And he sat down there. I thought we was going to eat our lunch. And I started to get my lunch out and he pulled this little whistle out. And he's going to blow that little whistle. And uh, deers are very scary like that. They live under brush piles and everything while hunting season's going on. They have to to survive. And he, he blew this little whistle, and when he did, just across the little opening, a great big doe stood up. Now, the doe is the mother deer. And she stood up, and I looked at her. She was beautiful. And there are those big ears, the great big brown eyes, and, and she was looking for that baby. And he looked up to me like that. I thought, you won't do that, Bert. Surely you won't. So he slipped the shell up in his rifle, and he was a dead shot. And uh, I saw him. He blew it again. And the mother deer walked right out into that opening at 11 o'clock in the day. Now, that's unusual. They won't do that. No. Especially in hunting season that time of day, anyhow. She walked out there. Why? She, she was a mother. Her nature was mother. She was a mother at her heart. And her baby was in trouble. And he was calling for her, and she was looking for the baby. I thought, surely you're not cruel enough to kill that mother looking for a baby. He looked over at me like that, lizard eyes, and he tucked that gun, leveled down. I thought, oh, my, surely you won't do that. And that gallant mother walking out there, sitting there, and when the, the bolt went down on the gun to lock the shell in the chamber, when the bolt went down, the deer heard the bolt. And she turned, and she saw the hunter. He had raised like this to shoot her. And my, that scope hair right across her loyal heart. I thought, that big 30 680 grain bullet will blow her heart right out of her. I thought, how can you do that? A mother looking for and deceiving her. 
crawling like it's her baby and get her out there and then shoot her. And a loyal heart beating like that, how can you do it? How, how can you be so cruel? And I seen him level down, and the deer, instead of running like it ordinarily would, she just stood still. She wasn't afraid to die. Her baby was in trouble. Now look, she wasn't putting that on. She wasn't just acting, it was death. See? But she couldn't help it. She was a mother. That was her nature. A mother. And her baby, she was looking for it. It was crying. And she was looking for her, her baby. I just couldn't watch the act take place. I turned my head. I started praying. I said, Lord Jesus, don't let him do it. Don't let him do it. How can he do it? That poor mother standing there is going to blow her heart out of her. Well, I waited, and the gun never fired. And I turned to look, and the barrel was going like this. <laughs> he couldn't hold it no more. And he turned around looked at me, and out of those slanted eyes come forth great big tears running down his cheeks. He grabbed the gun and threw it on the ground. He grabbed me by the trouser leg on that drift of snow. He said, Billy, I've had enough of it. I've had enough of it. Lead me to that Jesus you're talking about. What was the matter? He saw something real. He saw something that wasn't put on. Oh, if we could only be a, the Christian that that dear was a mother. See? And yet Jesus said, could a mother forget her suckling babe? Yes, she could, but I can never forget you. Your names are engraved on the palms of my hands. Let us bow our heads just a moment. How many that's in divine presence at this time, while we hurry, would quickly would say, God, I pray thee now to make me as good a Christian as that dear was a mother, that I'll be fearless. I'll, I, love, I want to love you the way that dear loved the mother, uh, loved their father. Raise your hand, say, God bless you. God bless you. Be the, that type of love. Our Heavenly Father, there are those sitting here, many, yes, hundreds, raise their hand, that they would like to have that experience. The reason that dear could display that motherhood, that gallery, is because she was a mother. Her nature was mother. Oh, God. Make us Christians. Our nature Christians, Lord. Not just something to put on and say, I belong to this or that. But make us Christians at heart. Plant thy word and love in our hearts, Lord. That we we'll, can be and represent to the world a display of Christianity and godly love as that old dear did that day of motherhood. Granted, Father, I pray for each one that raised their hand. May that experience come to them. Maybe there's some here that don't know no more than just joining church. They've never seen anything real. But a greater than Solomon is here. Jesus himself, which is the same yesterday, today, and forever. May the waiting audience in watching the prayer line tonight see the display of the love of God and the truth of God. That his word is truth. That he is not dead. He's alive forevermore. And in seeing this, may they surrender their lives completely to thee and become thy children and have love in their hearts that would even send them to death without any fear. As David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I'll fear no evil. Like that mother deer walking out of that woods right out into the shadows of death, right out in the open. David said, I'll go through the valley of the shadow of death. I'll fear no evil. Thou art with me. God, that's what we all want to be. Grant it, Lord. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you. I'm sorry to have kept you so long. I just look like I just can't hardly stop talking. Up. But we're going to pray for the sick now. I would that all would kind of keep your seats just for a few minutes. I promise to put the prayer line through tonight. I want to do that. And if I know we're supposed to close this earlier than this, but I, I know we're about... And, I, and the custodian, I certainly appreciate your kindness, sir. Without jerking the lights off, may the light of God flash into your life. If it isn't there now, take you to glory someday. Now, uh, where's Billy? Eight.
from one to a hundred. All right. They get right while we're in a hurry. Usually we, we mingle them up. And when the boy gives out the prayer cards, he mixes them up right before you and just gives you a prayer card as you wish. See. So they're all mixed up. We never know where we're going to call from. Many here has been in the meetings before. That is so that that boy could not sell a prayer card that we called a guy doing once. We couldn't do that. Neither does he know. He said, well, you give me this card while I get in the line. He doesn't know. The first place, they're all mixed up, and he, he just gives you a card. And then he doesn't know, and I don't know until we come here. Usually I count so many in this row and divide it with so many in this row and get an answer some way, or just start from somewhere. But tonight we're going to omit that and just begin from number one because we're late. And a prayer card, just stand out just one at a time as I call your number. And if you can't get up, someone will help you and bring you up here. Now, how many here doesn't have a prayer card and you're sick? Just pray. God bless you. That's fine. Now, I want the prayer card number one. Who has it? Right there. Would you come here, lady? Right here. Number two. Who has prayer card A number was that A? A number two. Two. Who has a uh, lady here? Would you come right over here, lady? Number three. Uh, come right over here. Four. Uh, come right here, sir. Five. Who has prayer card five? Would you hold your hand? The lady. Six. This is, keeps it from being like an arena, you know, it's where this is church. Six. Seven. All right. Number eight. All right. Just take your position. Eight. Eight. Nine. Eleven. I didn't see 11. Now, it might be somebody deaf. Would you look at your neighbor's card? Uh, 11. You have 11, do you, lady? Will you hold your hand? I, oh, she's deaf, I see. Will you watch her card there when she's called? All right, 11. You got it? 11. 12. Prayer card 12, the lady here. 13. Prayer card number 13. Um uh, it's 13, prayer card 13, 13. Blue hat, I thought I Alright, uh, check the lady there. See, lady with a blue hat. Is your thir- 12. And you have 13, do you? 13, I'm sorry. 14. Alright. 15. I believe that would be about as much as we can take right at this time. Just see, we're getting the line congested. Now, the rest of you that doesn't have a prayer card, is there anybody here for their first time? Let's see your hands. Well, we're happy to have you tonight. Uh, have you been in the meetings before? Raise your hands. Have you been in the meeting? All right. Now, anyone knows that we don't claim to be healers. We, we can't heal people. Jesus has already did that. But we claim that he is the same yesterday and forever. And if we can only know and recognize him in our midst, that Jesus is here, if he stood here and you could see him with your eyes, would it give you faith? Sure. But you see, he won't do that. When he comes, time's over then. He's coming for us then. But the person of the Holy Ghost. Now, if someone might come up here with nail scars in their hands and thorns all over their face. That would just be an impersonator. That would be an imposter. Anybody could do that. But even in that, if it didn't produce the life of Christ, it still wouldn't be Christ. No. It has to be Christ's life. Now, and the Bible said that he's a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Now, you people out there without prayer cards, now let's just take something and say, now, while we're praying, you just say, O oh, great high priest, Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, if there's any sin in your life, confess it, get it out, and you in the prayer line do the same thing, because it'd be well assured it'll be called out right here. If you're anything wrong that you don't want called out on the platform, step out of the line. Because how many knows that? Yes, sir. It'll be called right here. So get it under the blood. See? So, and, uh, and just say, forgive me of my, of my sins and help me to believe you. And I'm sick, Lord, and I want to be well for your glory. See, God doesn't heal just to be healing. See? No, he does it for the glory of God. And we must confess our sins and our unbelief. And look at the father that brought the child with the epilepsy that the disciples could not cure. Jesus said, I can if you believe. He said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. See, he, he, he cried out because he was in need. Now, you there, you pray to God and say, God, Brother Branham doesn't know me. He doesn't know me. But I know you do. So let me touch your garment. Let, let me touch your garment because you're a high priest. And then you speak to Brother Branham. 
and say like you did the woman that touched your garment on earth. Because if you're a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities, the same yesterday, today, and forever, he'll have to act in the same way. How many of you think believe that day when that woman touched him and went and sat down? Do you think it influenced the people there? See, it, it probably did. Well, it would. while well, we Gentiles of this day, we're just as thankful for Jesus. We should be more thankful. See, and this little woman touched him. She went over and sat down. Jesus said, just a moment, who touched me? Who touched me? While Peter rebuked him, said, Lord, in other words, it won't be the same thing for you to say that. While you're well thought of amongst the people as a prophet, well, how would you say who touched me? And everybody's touching. He said, yes, but otherwise this is a different kind of a touch. See? See? Uh, virtue went out of me, strength. And he looked around until he found the woman, told her she had a blood issue, and she felt in her own body that it stopped, for he said, thy faith has saved thee. See? Now, he's the same high priest. And now, if you can just touch him, now, to touch me wouldn't do a bit of good. I'm just like your husband, your brother, your father, see? Uh, to touch one of the pastors, it'd do just the same thing, see? But touch him. He's the one. I don't know you. I don't know anything about you. I could not heal you. If I could, I sure do it. But I can't. I can't do what he's already done. I, now, if he was standing here, he would just make himself knowing that he's among you. Just think of it. Now, we all know we're headed for something right away. We can feel that. Now, there's a right and wrong. There's too many different ways pointing to say, well, this is way that. There's got to be a right way somewhere. And to think that the very God that's going to judge you at judgment, to come right down here in your midst and stand with you right here. Wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. See? The works that I once did, he'll do it again. He promised to do it. You're my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, New York City. <laughs> all the world. Now, you just sit real quiet. You pray. Believe with all your heart. Don't doubt. Just believe with all that is in you. Believe soul, body, and spirit. And God will grant it to you. Now, let us bow our heads just a moment. Great creator of heavens and earth, all that I have stood here tonight and said will be of no account unless you come and prove that it's right. We've heard so much, and people have heard so much. Now, one word from you, Father, will make it all right. And we're looking for that. Now, we know that you only speak through human lips. You made man your agency. One day you were standing, you said, looked up on the harvest and said, it's right. said, pray the Lord of the harvest that he'll send laborers in his harvest. And you were the Lord of the harvest. But you so connected your program, you and man together. You do nothing apart from that. Now, I pray, God, and just, if you would anoint me and do not anoint this audience to believe, it won't do any good. We have to be together as one unit, as brothers and sisters. I pray, God, that you will anoint us together, that we might see again, again this side of eternity, the glorious Lord Jesus, a greater than Solomon being here. We ask that in his name. Amen. I want just to be as reverent as you can. Someday, if I die, when they're putting me in the grave, they'll be playing that. So, you know, when you hear that I'm gone, don't you believe I'm dead? I'm not. But just stop somewhere. If you hear it on the radio or somewhere, read it in paper. Just sing that song, won't you? Just remember. That's it. Just only believe. Now, in the audience, there's not one person in that line that I know. If each one of you in that line are strangers to me, and you know that I don't know nothing about you, know nothing what's wrong with you, just raise up your hand if you say. Now, you're perhaps sick. Maybe they're not. I don't know. It might be financial troubles, domestic troubles. I, I don't know. But now, if the little lady here will just come close. Thank you. That's all. Now, here's a woman much younger than I. We are probably born years apart, miles apart, our first time meeting. Now, she's here for some reason. I, I don't know. She may be sickness. I, I don't know what her trouble is. Whatever her trouble is, God knows. 
And if he reveals it, then she'll know whether it's the truth or not. Now, if the little lady would say, Brother Branham, I'm horribly sick. I, I, my stomach is bothering me. I, I have convulsions or, or something. Else. She looks like a healthy person. But you can't always go by that. And she'd say that. I'd say, well, the Bible said lay hands on the sick. That'd be the way Brother Roberts would pray for. Brother Allen or many of them. That's their ministry. Then they'd lay hands up on them and say, Satan, turn her loose. In Jesus' name, I rebuke you, Satan, or something like that. Say, go on now, you're healed. But she should believe that. See? That would be all right. Well, now, what if she's got some hidden sin there somewhere? You could pour a gallon of oil on her. Anoint her as many times, jump up and down and scream. That devil will lay right there. Amen. Unconfessed sin. You'll never move him. No, sir. But now, if the Holy Spirit can come down and tell her something it has been, she knows whether that's right or not, and then tell her what will be. And if what has been is right, what will be will be right. Isn't that right? Now, that's the kindness of our lovely Lord trying to get his bride together in this last days. You see, what he promised to do. How many would believe on him with all your heart if he would do such a thing? God bless you for your faithfulness. Now, this is a, a if you want to read, I ask you, if you caught me out of the scripture, tell me so. And write me a letter, tell one of the pastors and... Tell me where I'm wrong. I, I don't want to be wrong. I want to be right. And it's got to be this word. Now, let's just take this a little, like this. Let's take St. John 4, exactly, again. Here's a man and a woman meeting for their first time, like our Lord and the woman of Samaria. They met for their first time. And Jesus talked to her a little while until he found where her trouble was. Her trouble was immoral. And he told her what her trouble was, and quickly she recognized that, that he had to be a prophet. She said, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Said, We know Messiah's coming. When he comes, that's what he's going to do. Jesus said, I'm he. See? Now, if that's the way he identified himself to the people yesterday, he, if he's the same today, he'd have to identify himself the same way. Now, if the Holy Spirit would say that to her, then she'd know it had to come from some spiritual mean. It can't come from natural be some spiritual me. Now, she might say, like the Pharisees, it's Beelzebub, then that's up to her. She says, it's Christ, then that's up to her and Christ again. See, whatever it is. I'll be real reverent. I'm waiting for a moment for that anointing. That's what I'm stalling for. See, because I, it might not even come at all. If it doesn't, then we'll uh, bow our heads and dismiss the audience and come back tomorrow night and ask him for you. He's never failed me yet. Uh, before hundreds of thousands at a time, he's never failed. Now, he won't this time. I know he won't. I know he won't. I just know he won't. But see, I've got it on my mind that it's past closing time. You can't have, you can't be frustrated and the Holy Spirit work through you. You've got to settle down. Now, if there's any extra charge on this night, I'll pay for it. See, that's still. Now, Satan, you can't bluff us like that. I take charge and command over every spirit in here in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, I just, I will speak to the little lady. Now, if the Holy Spirit, sister, just Jesus talked to this lady, just a moment to catch her spirit, see, to see what was wrong. I believe that's what he done. The Father sent him up there. He had need to go by Samaria. Well, when he got up there, that's all he knows. He's up there. Here comes the woman. He know that must be the time. Now, the Father sent me up here. Here I am in New York, and here you are, the first person on the platform tonight. I don't know, but he will reveal it to me. And if he will, will it make you believe him with all your heart? You will accept. You'll know whether it's true or not. Not being a, a knowing you and being a stranger to you. But your trouble, what you, you've got several troubles. But your main trouble that you're wanting prayer for, it's in your throat. You have a throat trouble. Is that right? Raise up your hand. You believe it? Just a moment. Now, that would be all right. You say, you might have guessed that, Brother Branham. No, I never. I always catch up in the audience. He guess that. Now, just a moment. Let's talk to you a little more. You're conscious that there's something going on. See? Now, if the audience, how many have seen that picture of the angel of the Lord, that light, hanging in Washington, D.C.? 
That's hanging right by her now. Did you see that? It looks like, of course, the anointing is here now. I can see it. See? It's right over. Yes, here it is. She's got, yes, her trouble is in her throat. She's been weary. And, um, uh, it, well, she's got a, a tumor in her throat. That's exactly right. Not only that, but you have a thyroid trouble is bothering you. Is that right? See? All right. Do you believe now that that's Jesus Christ in here that knows you and all about it? You accept him as your healer? Go and be well. You know what I mean? See, I'm, see? It's just that he knows all things. How do you do it, young lady? Now, you're just a little bit shocked, you see, because just as soon as it come up, the lady come up, that light come right over. And she's conscious. Now, look, I don't know the woman. I, I don't know nothing about her. But she's standing there, just a young woman. And now, if uh, the Holy Spirit can reveal to me what your desire is from God, you are a Christian, see. And uh, so if, uh, if you wasn't, I, he'd tell me that, see. But you are a Christian. I mean a real Christian. And if he would, uh, if he would reveal to me what your desires are from him, would you believe me to be his prophet or a servant? I have once seen it. Kind of uh, you would believe it. You know that I'm a stranger to you. Now, it really isn't yourself you're here for. I see a, a woman, an elder woman, uh, right? It's your mother. Uh -huh. And she is not here. And she's, you've been very upset about her. She's bothered, too, of cancer, and you're wondering about her conditions. Do you believe, young lady, that that's the Holy Spirit doing that? Now, take the handkerchief from your purse and go home where you see to your mother, or send it to her, and uh, put, uh, send a handkerchief to her in commemoration of this prayer tonight. And don't doubt in your heart, but believe that Jesus, uh, yes, in the darkness will leave her. And she'll be, you believe, all right, go now, and Lord bless you. God bless you, mother. You believe with all your heart? Now, just don't doubt. Just have faith. Uh, just a moment. Excuse me, just a moment. Something happened. There was somebody else appeared here. Just who was the lady that was just prayed for here? Where's she at? Here? Oh yes, that was right. Just a moment. No. Just a second. The Holy Spirit is someone else. Come, see, it's a light, and it's like... Yes, it's this colored lady sitting right here. Yes, you are sitting there praying for healing. Now, you're a stranger to me. I don't know you. But do you believe that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and forever? You believe that high blood pressure is going to leave you and you're going to be well? That's what you're praying about. <laughs> What does she touch? She can't touch me. She's too far from me. She touched the high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. Just believe. Now, see, you don't have to be up here. You be there. Just believe. That's all I ask you to do. Just believe. Here's a lady sitting right back here looking down this way of praying. She's praying not for herself. She's praying for a loved one because that this uh, someone just left here that was praying for a loved one, a lady for her mother, but this lady's praying for her father. And her father, I see a rolling sea. He's, he, he's, not, he's from overseas or something. Norway, Norwegian. That's exactly right. Believe on the Lord Jesus, young lady, and your father will be healed. Now, what does she touch? Ask her if she knows me. Is that what she's praying about? Wait, wave your hands if that's right. That's right. We're strangers, is that right? That's right. All right. You have your request if you'll only believe. What does she touch? 20 yards from me. She touched the high priest. See? Not me. I don't know her. But she touched the high priest, the lovely Lord Jesus, who's with us tonight. You are a stranger. To, is this the patient? Is, is this the person? Um, uh, see, I just have to follow that the way it leads me. See, like that woman 
See, he picked her out. See, she, she touched God through him. Well, there are people out there. That's what they're doing. They're touching God. See, it just, I have to turn away uh, dealing. Now, we are strangers to each other. I do not know you. I've never seen you in my life. We are strangers. So the people see. We're strangers. We don't know each other. Now, if the Lord Jesus uh, would reveal to me something that you know that I don't know nothing about, then that would have to come through supernatural power. You see, divine healing, if you want healing, I don't know that's what you want. See, sometimes it's for somebody else in domestic trouble, finances, and things. But he can supply all. If he knows what you have need of, he can reveal it to me. See, and then if he does, then you know it's him. See, you know it's got to be him. Would that make all of you believe? Amen. Now, she seems to be a nice person. Okay. Now, let's just talk a moment. I left, just went to the audience. <laughs> Somebody just be reverent. See, it's that great pull of faith that just takes it right. You feel it. Virtue. I preached about an hour and a half. And one vision makes me more weak, and I preached ten hours. Strength. Virtue is strength. See, you're doing that. It's not me. I'm not, these visions isn't me. It's you doing it. It's your faith in God that's doing it. It's not me. I'm not, I, I, I'm just sitting here as a representative like this here. This is a, this is a mute, this speaker, unless there's a live voice speaking in it. It can't speak itself. Neither can I speak. It's him, the live one. Christ, the living one. He speaks and he knows who you are and what you've done. Let's come back to talk to the lady. If the Lord Jesus will reveal to me something in your life that you're maybe what you're wanting of Him, because being a believer, you you are asking Him something, and if He will reveal it to me, do you believe that you would receive it? Yes. You would believe it. Now, if your trouble is in the stomach. Yes. An examination has shown that your stomach has fallen. Yes. That's right. Is that right? Yes. And here's another thing. In the examination, they find you got a tumor in your yes. stomach. Is that right? Yes. You believe? Yes. You believe God can tell me who you are? Yes. Miss Willard, you go ahead home now and believe. <laughs> you, you believe with all your heart? Now, I ask the lady. We've never seen one another in life. But it's the Holy Spirit. Be sure. I'd be real reverent. Tell me when you got enough time now. See, well, see, 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 see. Now, how do you do, sir? Uh, we're strangers to each other, and you realize that someday we've got to meet God. And being a stranger to me and I to you, if the Lord Jesus would reveal to me your troubles, would you believe that it's Him? And you know that I, a man, would not know that, but it would take Him to do it. Is that right? I hate to say this. The boy is shadowing. <laughs> See? It's a darkness story. And it's, um, it's a very serious thing is wrong. You have cancer. That's right. And an x-ray has shown and revealed that the cancer is in the stomach. And also it's on the wall of the stomach. It's on the, is that right? That's why I see the picture of the x-ray that's shown. On the wall of the stomach. Now that means that you must go soon. If not, God help you. Will you accept it, my brother? Jesus, cancer is nothing to Jesus Christ, no more than a headache. You believe it? Now something has happened and you had a real good feeling. See? Now if you'll keep on breathing like that, the shadow left you. Your faith saves you. Go believe in God. May God make you well. God can heal arthritis. Don't you believe that? Amen. Well, just start walking. Say, thank you, Lord. <laughs> if thou canst believe, all things are possible to them that, that believe. How it made you feel strange when I said arthritis. That's what you have, too. You can't get up all that morning. It stiffens you up. It's over now if you believe it. That's my condition. Make it You believe God can heal that? Receive Him. Go in Jesus Christ. Make you well and believe with all your heart. You want to go eat your supper? Enjoy it. Stomach trouble over and go eat well? Go believe it. 
Yes, I ought to see. God can heal back trouble or anything else. Don't you believe that? You believe it heal yours? Go on your road, rejoice. I can't believe it. You believe me to be his prophet or his servant? You believe God can heal heart trouble? You can't believe that. You have a lady's trouble for one thing, an arthritis. Is that right? You believe he's the healer divine? Accept him as your healer. Go rejoice and sin. Thank you, Lord. You have a lady's troubles bothered you for a long time. You've also got heart trouble. It's just about to kill you. You got a you got a pumping, slow pumping heart. Believe with all your heart, you'll never bother you no more. Blood condition. You believe that God can make that blood bring that anemic condition back, make it well? You believe that? No, go believe in that diabetes and everything you believe. You believe with all your heart. You believe that He heals you standing there sleeping with all your heart. You believe that God makes you completely well told? God bless you. Go on your own and rejoice. That back trouble will never bother you again and make you feel real good, wouldn't it? All right, go rejoice and say, Thank you, Lord Jesus. Believe in all your heart. Blood. In your blood. Drip thin. Diabetes. You believe that God can heal diabetes? Let's go to Calvary for a blood transfusion. You'll take it away from you. You got chest trouble, don't you? I was going to call you a few minutes ago. Just a few minutes ago, you was looking to me, and I turned to look at you, and you caught my eye and looked down. A real strange feeling come over you. The chest trouble left you. It's gone. It was a nerve condition that blocked your chest. You believe? What do you think out there with that arthritis sitting on the end of the seat? You believe? Stand up. Jesus Christ makes you well. I challenge you to believe God. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you believe it? Oh, we believe it. All right. If you believe with all your heart, lay your hands on each other. He cannot fail. He's God. The lovely Lord Jesus. His resurrected power, His identification. Each one, lay your hands on one another. Heavenly Father, the enemy is on the run. The enemy is defeated. Jesus Christ lives and reigns. Oh God, be merciful and grant the healing of these people. Satan, you've lost the battle. Jesus Christ is has won the victory in this auditorium tonight. You are exposed. You are just a bluff. And we call your hand in the love of Calvary. Come out of this people. In the name of Jesus Christ, you lead in the name of Calvary.